and welcome to Wednesday's 11 Do's with Fran. So here's how this works. You go get a cup of tea and ideally a piece of cake and have your 11s, which is a much underused word these days, but really an excellent one. And I read you a short story. Today's is going to be Gilbert by Rosamond Pilcher. And let's hope we all find it comforting and calming and a bit of a distraction during these crazy few days and weeks. Gilbert by Rosamond Pilcher. Awaking, aware, without opening his eyes of sunlight and a band of warmth lying across the bed, Bill Rawlins was pervaded with a sense of marvellous contentment and well-being. A number of pleasant thoughts crossed his mind. That it was a Sunday, so he didn't have to go to work. That it was going to be a fine day. That his wife lay close to him, her head pillowed in the curve of his arm that he was, in all probability, one of the most fortunate men in the world. The bed was huge and downy. An old aunt of Bill's had given it to them as a wedding present when he married Clodagh two months ago. It had, been a mar his, it had been her marriage bed, his aunt had informed him with certain relish, and to make the gift more acceptable, had thrown in a beautiful new mattress and six pairs of heirloom linen sheets. It was about the only thing in the house, apart from his desk and his clothes, that actually belonged to Bill. Marrying a widow had posed certain complications, but where they were to live was not one of them, because there could have been no question of Clodda and her two small girls moving into Bill's two-room bachelor flat, and there seemed little point going to all the hassle and expense of buying themselves a new house when hers was already so perfect. His flat had been in the middle of the town, within walking distance of the office, but this house lay a mile or so out into the country, and had as well the advantage of a large and rambling garden. Besides, Clodder pointed out, it was the children's home. Here were their secret hideouts, the swing in the sycamore tree, the playroom in the attic. Bill needed no persuasion. It was the right and obvious thing to do. You're going to live in Clodder's house, his friends exclaimed, looking astonished. Why not? A bit tricky, surely. After all, that's where she lived with her first husband. Very happily too, Bill pointed out, and I hope she'll be just as happy with me. Clodda's husband and the father of her two little girls had been killed in a tragic car smash three years ago. Bill, though he'd worked and lived in the district for some years, didn't meet her until two years later, when he was asked, as a suitable man to make up numbers, to a dinner party, and there found himself sitting next to a tall and slender girl whose thick blonde hair was wound up into a knot at the back of her, ele her elegant head. Her finely boned face he instantly found beautiful, and yet, at the same time, sad, her eyes were grave, her mouth hesitant. It was this very sadness that caught at his tough and experienced heart. Her fragile neck, exposed by the old-fashioned hairstyle, seemed to him vulnerable as a child's. And when at last he made her laugh and a smile came into its own, he fell, like any young man, head over heels in love. You're going to marry her? asked those same astonished friends. One thing marrying a widow, another marrying a ready-made family. That's the bonus. Glad you think so, old boy. Ever had anything to do with children? No, he admitted, but it's never too late to start. Clodder was 33, Bill was 37. A confirmed bachelor, that's what he was known as. A handsome, cheerful sort of fellow, good for a game of golf and a useful player at the local tennis club, but definitely a confirmed bachelor. How would he manage? He managed by treating the two small girls like grown-ups. They were called Emily and Anna. Oh, hang on. They were called Emily and Anna. Emily was eight and Anna was six. Despite his determination not to be intimidated by them, he found their straight stir stares unnerving. They were both fair, with long hair and blue eyes of startling brightness. These two pairs of eyes watched him incessantly, moved around the room as he moved, showed neither affection nor dislike. They were very polite. From time to time during his courtship of their mother, he gave them small presents, tubes of sweets, puzzles or games to play. Anna, the less complicated child, was pleased by these, opened them at once and showed her delight in smiles and the occasional hug of appreciation. But Emily was a different kettle of fish. Politely, she would thank him then disappear with the parcel unwrapped 
to deal with her loot in private and presumably decide on her own to give or withhold approval. Once he was able to mend Anna's action man. She didn't play with dolls. And after that, there was a certain rapport between them, but any affection that Emily had to show was bestowed only on her pets. She had three, a hideous torn cat, which hunted ferociously and had no conscience about stealing any food he, he could get his brazen claws into. A smelly old spaniel who couldn't go for a walk without returning filthy and a goldfish. The cat was called Breaky, the dog was called Henry and the goldfish was called Gilbert. Breaky, Henry and Gilbert the, were three of the many good reasons why Bill moved into Clodder's house. One couldn't imagine these three demanding creatures being domiciled anywhere else. Emily and Anna came to the wedding in pink and white dresses with pink satin sashes. Everybody said they looked angelic, but all through the ceremony, Bill was comfortably aware of their cool blue eyes boring holes in the back of his neck. When it was over, they dutifully flung a bit of confetti and ate some wedding cake and then departed to stay with Clodder's mother while Clodder and Bill went off on the honeymoon. He took her to Marbella and the sun-drenched days slipped by each a little better than the one before, enriched by laughter and shared experiences and starlit nights. By the end though, Clodder was missing her children. She said a sad goodbye to Marbella, but Bill knew that she was looking forward to getting back. When they drove up the short approach to her house, Emily and Anna were there, waiting for them, with a homemade banner held aloft, proclaiming in wobbly capitals that they were welcome home. Welcome home. Now it was his home. Now he was not only husband, but father as well. Now when he drove to the office, he had two small girls in the back of his car to be unloaded onto the pavement in front of their school. Now at weekends, he didn't play golf, but cut grass and planted out lettuces and mended things. A house without a handyman can slide into disrepair. And this house had had no man in it for nearly three years. There seemed no end to the squeaking hinges, defunct toasters and bulky lawn mowers. Out of doors, gates sagged, fences collapsed and sheds demanded creosote. As well, there were Emily's animals, which seemed to thrive on emergency and drama. The cat disappeared for three days and was given up for dead, only to, only to reappear with a torn ear and a hideous wound, wound on his side. No sooner had he been wheeled off to the vet than the old dog ate something unspeakable and was sick for four days, lying in his basket and gazing at Bill with red-rimmed, reproachful eyes, as though the whole thing was his fault. Only Gilbert the goldfish remained boringly healthy, <laughs> swimming around his tank in aimless circles, but even he needed constant care and attention, his tank cleaned and special food purchased from the pet shop. Bill coped with all this as best as he could, remaining deliberately patient and cheerful. When tantrums blew up and there were quarrels and fights, usually ending with cries of, it's not fair, and an earth-shaking slam of a door, he kept out of the way, leaving the necessary arbitration to Clodder, terrified of getting involved and saying or doing the wrong thing. What was that all about, he would ask, when Clodagh returned to him, looking exasperated, amused, exhausted, but never cross. And, he, and she would try to explain, and then stop explaining, because after about a minute of her explanation, he would probably have put his arms around her and started kissing her. He found himself amazed that despite these, all these domestic up, ups and downs, the magic they discovered in Marbella wasn't lost to them. Things still seemed to get better with each passing day, and he loved his wife to the very extent of his being. And now it was Sunday morning. Warm sun, warm bed, warm wife. He turned his head and buried his face in her neck. But as he did this, a warning chord struck. He was being watched. He turned his head back and opened his eyes. Emily and Anna in their night dresses and with their long straight hair tousled from sleep, sat on the brass rail at the end of the bed, observing him. He said, Hello there. Anna said, we're hungry. We want breakfast. What time is it? She spread her hands. I don't know. He reached out and found his watch. Eight o'clock, he told them. We've been awake for ages and we're starving. Well, your mother's still asleep. I'll cook you breakfast. They didn't move. He eased his arm from beneath Clodagh's shoulders and sat up. 
Their faces showed disapproval of his naked state. He said, you go get your clothes on and clean your teeth and by the time you're ready, I'll have breakfast on the table. They went, their bare feet pattering on the polished floor. When they were safely out of sight, he climbed out of bed, pulled on a toweling robe, closed the door of the bedroom silently behind him and went downstairs. In the kitchen, Henry snored in his basket. Bill stirred him awake with a toe and the old do dog yawned, had a good scratch and finally deigned to climb out of his bed. Bill led him to the back door and opened it onto the kitchen. Oh, and opened it onto the garden and Henry made his way outdoors. As he did this, Breaky appeared from nowhere, looking more like a battered old tiger than ever and shot past Bill's bare legs into the kitchen. In his mouth was a large dead mouse, which he laid in the middle of the floor and then settled down to devour. It was too early in the day for such cannibalism. At risk to life and limb, Bill removed the mouse and dropped it into the trash can, tra and dropped it into the trash can under the sink. Breaky was furious and set up such a caterwauling, so, good word, caterwauling, set up such a caterwauling that Bill was forced to calm him with a saucer of milk. Breaky drank this as messily as he could, splashing milk all over the lino, and then, when the saucer was emptied, leapt up onto the window seat, closed his eyes and started to wash himself. After he'd wiped out the milk, Bill put on a kettle, found the frying pan, the bacon and eggs, put the bread in the toaster, laid the scrub pine table. And when this was done, the two little girls had still not appeared. So he went back upstairs to dress. As he pulled on an old cotton shirt, he heard them going down to the kitchen, chattering in their high pitched voices. They sounded happy, but a moment later, there floated up to him a wail of despair that chilled his heart. With his shirt still unbuttoned, he shot out onto the landing. What is it? Another wail. Imagining every sort of horror, he bolted downstairs and into the kitchen. There, Emily and Anna stood with their backs to him, staring into the goldfish tank. Anna's eyes brimmed with tears, but Emily seemed too stricken to weep. What's happened? It's Gilbert! He crossed the floor and over their heads peered into the tank. At its bottom, on his side, with one round, lifeless eye staring upwards, lay the goldfish. He's dead, said Emily. How do you know? Because he is. He certainly looked dead. Perhaps he's having a sleep, Bill suggested, without much hope. No, he's dead, he's dead. With that, the two of them burst into tragic tears. With an arm for each, Bill tried to comfort them. Anna pushed her face into his stomach and wound her arms around his thigh. But Emily stood rigid, sobbing uncontrollably. Her skinny arms crossed over her bony chest as though she were trying to hold herself together. It was terrible. His first instinct was to free himself and go to the foot of the stairs and yell for help. Clodda would know what to do. And then he thought, no, here was a chance to show his mettle. Here was a chance to break down the barriers, to cope on his own and earn their respect. He calmed them down at last, found a clean tea towel to use as a handkerchief led them to the window seat and sat them down, one on either side of him. Now, he said, listen. He's dead. Gilbert's dead. Yes, I know he's dead. But when people or pets that we're fond of die, what we do is to bury them decently, give them a beautiful funeral. So look, why don't the pair of you go out into the garden and find a really peaceful spot where you can dig a nice hole? and I'll see if I can rustle up an old cigar box or something to use as a coffin for Gilbert. And you can make wreaths to put on the top of his grave and perhaps a little cross. The two pairs of blue eyes, watchful as ever, slowly showed some interest. Tears were still wet on their cheeks, but drama and high, dra but drama and high tragedy had great appeal and were too attractive to resist. When Mrs. Donkins in the village died, her daughter wore a black veil on her hat, Emily remembered. Perhaps your mother can find a black veil for your hat. Or oh, there's one in the dressing up box. There you are, you can wear that. What am I going to wear? Anna wanted to know. I'm sure mummy will find something for you. I want to make the cross. No, I do, but he interrupted quickly. The first thing to do is to decide on a good place. 
Why don't you both nip off and do that while I cook you some breakfast? And then after breakfast, but they didn't listen for more. On the instant, they were up and away, not able to wait. At the back door, Emily stopped. We'll need a spade, she said in her most businesslike manner. You'll find a trowel in the tool shed. They spread across the gut. They sped across the garden, brimming with enthusiasm, all sorrow forgotten in the excitement of a real grown-up funeral with black veils on their hats. With mixed feelings, he watched him go. The little scene had left him drained and ravenously hungry. Grinning wryly to himself, he went back to the stove and began frying up the bacon. As he did this, there came the sound of soft footsteps on the stair and the next moment his wife appeared through the door. She wore her nightdress and a loose cotton dressing gown. Her hair was all over her shoulders, her feet bare, her eyes... <laughs> I've just seen somebody said, step up, Bill. I agree, absolutely right. Very much enjoying your running commentary here. Step up, Bill, come on, get it together. <laughs> um, what was all that about, Clodda asked through a yawn. Hello, my darling, did we wake you? Was somebody crying? Yes, Emily and Anna. Gilbert's dead. Gilbert? Oh no, I don't believe it. He went to kiss her. I'm afraid it's true. Oh, poor Emily. She drew away from his embrace. He's really dead. See for yourself. Clodder went to the fish tank and peered inside. But why? I don't know. I don't know much about goldfish. Perhaps he ate something that disagreed with him. But he wouldn't just die like that. You obviously know more about goldfish than I do. When I was Anna's age, I had a goldfish of my own. It was called Goldie original name. They fell silent while she observed the lifeless Gilbert. Then she said thoughtfully, I remember Goldie once behaving just like that and my father gave him a tot of whiskey and he started swimming around again. Besides, when fish are dead, they float to the top of the water. Bill ignored this last observation. A tot of whiskey? Have you got any? Yes, I have one precious bottle which I keep for my closest friends. I suppose Gilbert qualifies, and if you want, you can certainly try a reviver, but it seems rather a waste to pour the stuff over a dead fish, like casting pearls before swine. <laughs> Clodda didn't reply to this. Instead, she rolled up her sleeve, put her hand into the tank, and touched Gilbert's tail with a gentle finger. Nothing happened. Oh, it was hopeless. Bill went back to the pan of sizzling bacon. Perhaps he was being a bit mean about the whiskey. He said, if you want, you can... <gasps> He's waggled his tail. He has. He's all right. He's swimming. Oh, look, darling. And indeed, Gilbert the goldfish was. He'd righted himself, shaken out his little golden fins and was once more in his regular circuit, right as rain. Clodder, you're a miracle worker. Look at him. In passing, Gilbert's fishy eye met Bill's. He knew a moment's annoyance. Stupid fish giving me a fright like that, he said to it. And then he grinned in real relief. Emily will be overjoyed. Where is she? He remembered the funeral. He said, she's in the garden with Anna. For some reason, he didn't tell Clodder about the plans that had been made. He didn't tell her what they were doing. Their mother smiled. Well, now that, now that little problem's been resolved, I'm going up to have a bath. I'll leave you to break the happy news. And she blew him a kiss and took herself up, off upstairs. Minutes later, as the bacon sizzled and the coffee perked, the two little girls reappeared, exploding through the open back door in a whirlwind of excitement. We found a lovely place, Bill, under the rose bush in Mummy's border, and we've dug a huge hole, and I've made a daisy chain, and I've made a sort of cross out of two bits of wood, but I'll need net string or a nail or something to hold them together. And we're going to sing a hymn. Yes, we're going to sing All Things Bright and Beautiful. And we thought, let me tell him, we thought... Now, just listen. He had to raise his voice in order to make himself heard over the din, they fell silent. Just listen for a moment and look. He led them over to the fish tank. Look. They looked. They saw Gilbert swimming around in his usual pointless fashion, his fragile, translucent tail flicking, his round eyes looking no more lively than when he had been presumed dead. <laughs> there was, for a moment, total silence. See? He wasn't dead at all, just having a kip. Mummy gave him a tickle and that stirred his stumps. Still silence. Isn't that great? Even to himself, 
he sounded quite sickening, sickeningly hearty. Neither little girl said a word. <laughs> Someone's just said goldfish are kind of pointless. I mean, sure, I won't argue with that. Neither little girl said a word. Bill waited and then finally Emily spoke. Emily said, let's kill him. <laughs> Bill found himself torn between horrified shock and uncontrollable mirth. And for a second, it was touch and go as to whether he actually struck the child or dissolved into laughter. By a superhuman effort, he did neither of those things. But there was a long and pregnant pause before he finally said, with monumental calmness, oh no, I don't think we want to do that. Why not? Because, well, it's wrong to kill any living creature. Why is it? Well, it's, it's wrong to kill anything, even if it's only a goldfish. Besides, you love Gilbert. He belongs to you. You can't kill the thing you love. Emily's bottom lip protruded. But I want to have a funeral. You promised. But not Gilbert. We'll bury someone else. <laughs> what? Who? Anna knew her sister well. Not my action man, she stipulated firmly. No, of course not action man. He cast about for ideas and was visited with a brainwave. A mouse, a poor dead mouse, look. And like a conjurer, he opened the trash can with his toe on the lever and produced, with a certain flourish, Breaky's hunting trophy, holding its small stiff body up by the tail. Breaky brought it in this morning and I took it away from him. Surely you wouldn't want a poor old mouse to end up in the dustbin. Surely he deserves a bit of a ceremony. They stared at his offering. And after a bit, Emily said, can we put him into the cigar box like you said? Of course. And sing hymns and everything. Of course, all creatures great and small. Nothing could be much smaller than this. He found a paper towel, laid it on the dresser and placed the body of the mouse carefully upon it. Then he washed his hand and drying them, turned to face the two little girls. What do you say? Can we do it right away? Let's eat breakfast first. I'm starving. Anna went at once to the table to pull out a chair and settle herself. But Emily lingered for another reassuring check on Gilbert. Her nose was pressed against the glass wall of the tank. Her finger traced a pattern following his convolutions. Bill waited patiently. Presently, she turned her head to look at him. Their eyes met with a long, steady stare. She said, I'm glad he wasn't dead. Me too, he smiled. And she smiled back and all at once looked so like her mother that without thinking, he opened his arms to her and she came to him and they hugged without words, without needing words. He stooped and kissed the top of her head and she didn't try to wriggle away or detach herself from this, their first tentative embrace. You know something, Emily, he told her. You're a good girl. You're good too, she said. And his heart was filled with gratitude because somehow, by the grace of God, he had neither said nor done the wrong thing. He'd got it right. It was a beginning. Not much, but a beginning. Then Emily enlarged on this. Really, really good really really good perhaps in that case it was more than a beginning and he was just about halfway there filled with gratification he gave her a final hug and let her go and at last in happy anticipation of the mouse's funeral they all sat down to breakfast i just think that's the most memorable story by rosamond pilcher the, the line when emily says Let's kill him. Like, she wants to kill him, kill the goldfish anyway, just for the sort of glamour and excitement of a funeral. Um, it's just astonishing and really kind of illustrates that amazing beauty and power of short stories. You, with the best ones, you just never know where they're going. Um, anyway, that was called Gilbert by Rosamond Pilcher. Uh, it is from the second Persephone book of short stories. And join me again at 11 o'clock tomorrow for more Elevenses with Fran and another short story. And hope you enjoyed it. And that's it for today. Ta-da!